This is RTV6 News at 5. Working for you. First at five, we begin with our Storm Team 6 forecast. As you can see, rain and storms have moved into a portion of the state. In that radar picture right now, we're tracking the potential for severe weather. And that is why, at this moment, it is a Storm Team 6 alert day. Meteorologist Todd Clausen is here with us now. And Todd, what's the timeline of these storms? We're looking at the radar and they're moving in pretty quickly. Yeah, already into western Indiana. They're going to kind of slide eastward and southeastward as we go throughout the remainder of the evening. But we already do have a few severe thunderstorms warnings that are posted across parts of central Indiana. You have to go way down to the southwest to find these warnings, but they're in effect for a little while longer with damaging wind. Uh, the main threat from Sullivan over towards Bloomfield. I'm not expecting any severe weather in Indianapolis, although this rain is going to start to move in. So this is a solid batch of some pretty heavy rainfall and a little bit of lightning from Rockville to Vetersburg right now to Greencastle as we slide to the south. The further south you go, the more potent the storms get, and there's a little more lightning involved as well. Terre Haute to Brazil to Sullivan. These storms are moving off towards the east southeast at about 45 miles per hour. That's going to put them in Greencastle here within a few minutes. Ellettsville as we work our way towards Bloomington a little closer to the bottom of the hour and then eventually over into the Danville area in Hendricks County by about 529. So temperatures are in the 70s. There's a pretty sharp cutoff to the rain to the north. So if you do have evening plans here, the further south you are, the better potential for some localized flooding, the better potential for some damaging winds. But we all need to uh, monitor these storms throughout the evening hours as temperatures fall into the 70s. Obviously, there's a lot going on here across central Indiana. We'll talk more about these storms coming up for you here in just a few minutes. All right, Todd, we'll touch base with you soon. Some community members think the city of Indianapolis and a local anti-violence group have misled the public about what they say is the reality of violence on the city's east side. And today, those critics of the demonstration, as you can see, to get their message across about the number of homicides on the city's far east side. This all began on Monday when the 10 point coalition touted its work in several east side neighborhoods as a reason the area had not seen a homicide in a year. Uh, critics say a graphic and other parts of the Monday's announcement imply that the entire Far East Side has gone 365 days without a homicide and that it's due to the work of the 10 point coalition. But take a look at this map now at 5 o'clock. The red area is what the city considers the far east side. Those blue markers identify homicides. That much smaller green area is the portion patrolled by the 10-point coalition. That's the group was referencing on Monday. And that smaller area saw no homicides. One woman who lives there says 10 points and Mayor Joe Hogsett should apologize for what she says was an exaggeration of their success. Reverend Charles Harrison of Ten Point Coalition tells RTV6 tonight that he was clear that they were only talking about their specific patrol area. He told RTV6 in his own words that the claims of these individuals are not true and will be divisive during a time that Indy needs to come together to help curb the pattern of senseless violence in the city. And tonight, Eastsiders tell RTV6's Cameron Riddle they feel the city of Indianapolis is ignoring their friends and family killed by violence. At the center of this controversy is what really is the Far East Side. When it comes to Ten Point, it's a very specific area with a boundary that could end when you cross the street. We want clarity and we want an apology. These families have been disrespected. I just read off 20 names of individuals that were victims of homicide in the official Far East Side area. One, two, three. Local activist Shelly Covington was one of the more than a dozen people who lay on the ground in front of the city county building representing the murder victims they say the city and Ten Point Coalition are ignoring. It's a disservice to our community. It's a disservice to the families who has lost a victim on the Far East Side. It's a disservice to my family. We have lost a family member. Tonight on the News at 6, we talk to 10-point leader Reverend Charles Harrison as he explains exactly where the low homicide numbers come from. In Indianapolis, Cameron Riddle, 
our TV6. Uh, tonight at 5, the history for the Indianapolis Public Schools. Today, the state's largest school district named Elisa Johnson, their new superintendent. She will become the first African-American woman to lead the state's largest school district. Johnson has served as interim superintendent of IPS since January, but today the district promoted her to the full-time role. During Johnson's six-month tenure as interim superintendent, IPS created the family and community engagement team to listen to and learn from families and the community to cultivate student success. Johnson spoke to RTV6 today about what this means for her and the district. I think of just the impact it has for other African American girls or, you know, all of our kids in general to see a black woman in this place in leadership uh, for the first time in the district's history. Um, that's meaningful for them to know what, in fact, is possible. Johnson is a Hoosier native. She is from Evansville. She has been an educator for more than 16 years and has worked in a number of roles in Indianapolis, including four years with IPS, where she most recently served as deputy superintendent for academics. A Southside man is sharing this video here, hoping to catch the people seen smashing the windshield of his wife's car. You can see five young men walking down the alley behind Minister Russ Smith's home Wednesday night. They pass his wife's car, but then one of them comes back, climbs on the roof of the car, and jumps down on the windshield, smashing it. Not only was that car windshield smashed, the one next door was too. Smith shared the video on the Ring website for neighborhoods. He wants the person who did the damage caught. Retribution's not my thing, but I think they need to understand that this has a cost. They need to understand that there are consequences to actions like that. You want them to turn themselves in? Uh, I think it'd be better for them if they did. Uh, if, if it comes out that they are involved in this and then they do something else, it's just going to go much worse on them. And this all happened in the 2100 block of South Delaware. Smith has not filed a police report yet. The car belongs to the company his wife works for, and she's out of town. Again, he would like the person who smashed it to buy a new one. A Camby man is facing a legal fight over accusations that he's connected to an animal fighting ring. Owen County prosecutors have filed charges against Martin Anderson. Anderson's properties in Poland and Canby were under surveillance since police received a tip back in August of 2018. Court documents say police found signs of animal fighting activities and led to the removal of hundreds of animals. Now, Anderson is facing multiple criminal charges, including promoting an animal fighting contest. He is now set to go on trial in October. Still ahead at 5.30 on RTV6, many families get into debt while paying for childcare over the summer. Working for you, our Scripps team finds some low-cost options. But first, a warning for all cell phone and tablet use users. That's just about everyone. The health concern now emerging, what you have to see to believe. And Amanda, a line of thunderstorms making their way into central Indiana at this hour. We have a few thunderstorm warnings to the south. We'll talk about the threats and the timeline as these storms move through on your Friday evening. Coming up in Maine weather in just a few minutes. And mile warranty at Honda of Fishers. Welcome back to the news at five on RTV6. Tonight, President Trump explains his decision to abort an attack against Iran. He says after they shot down an unmanned American drone, it wasn't, quote, proportionate to go through with the plan that could have killed 150 Iranians. Congress is now reacting. ABC's Trevor Alt with what's happening in Washington, D.C. Today, President Trump explaining his 11th hour decision to call off retaliatory strikes against Iran, telling NBC News the military had told him they were ready to go and needed a decision. They shot down an unmanned uh, drone, mm -hmm. plane, whatever you want to call it, and here we are sitting with 150 dead people uh, that would have taken place probably within a half an hour after I said go ahead. Yeah. And I didn't like it. I didn't think it was I didn't think it was proportionate. That decision coming just hours after top members of Congress were summoned to the Situation Room for a military and intelligence briefing on the ongoing conflict with Iran. But both Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and Speaker Nancy Pelosi said they weren't informed that a possible U.S. strike was imminent. House and Senate Democrats were very clear uh, that Congress must act 
uh, it must have the authority of Congress uh, before we initiate a military hostilities. Pelosi adding she's glad the president halted the attack, saying it would have been provocative. Other Democrats saying the president shouldn't be criticized for stopping the strike. Um, so I don't think the people should be jumping out of the president's throat for wanting to uh, think this through and make sure that uh, neither side miscalculates uh, and we don't inadvertently end up in a war with Iran. As both the U.S. and Iran stick to their conflicting stories over whether the surveillance drone was over international or Iranian territorial waters, a U.N. Security Council diplomat confirms to ABC News that the U.S. has called for closed consultations with the Security Council Monday to discuss the situation in the Middle East. The president specified over Twitter Friday morning there were three sites the military had targeted for this possible strike on Iran, but the president also said he is in no hurry to retaliate. Trevor Alt, ABC News, Washington. Hiring Hoosiers, an RTV6 initiative connecting you to job opportunities and tips that could land you the job that you want. And next week, there'll be a huge job fair for veterans in the Hoosier State. The Indianapolis Veterans Job Fair happening Thursday, June the 27th at Lucas Oil Stadium from 11 in the morning until 3 in the afternoon. Many companies from different industries will be, will be there looking to interview you and potentially make hires. Now, to register for that job fair and to learn more about what you can expect, we have a link on our website, HiringHoosiers.com. Working for you, a warning as we head into fireworks season. The Indiana Department of Insurance says if shooting fireworks is banned in your county and you cause accidental damage, it may not be covered by your homeowner's or renter's insurance policies. Now just keep that in mind before you shoot off fireworks for your Independence Day celebrations to avoid any surprise bills. As you get ready for your summer vacation, what are your plans for your pet? Working for you, John Mattery shows you some of the possible downsides to pet sitting services. So, of course, you don't waste your money. If you're going on vacation and you have a pet, it's a dilemma. Do you hire a pet sitter or send your dog or cat to the kennel? Well, some new apps make sitting so easy, but there are a few risks. Angela Davidson is a pet sitter. You lay down, lay down. She's a top-rated sitter for Rover, a sort of Airbnb for pets. For around $40 a night, she watches dogs for families on vacation while keeping an eye on their house, too. People just want somebody that can not only house sit, but pet sit also. And it kind of gives them a peace of mind that they know that their house is being cared for. Rover and competitor WAG appeal to people like Cecily Necht, who don't want to leave their beloved pet in a strange place. Not, not for a weekend or anything while I'm away. With pet sitting, your dog or cat gets to stay in the comfort of their own home. There's no worry about the stress of being in a strange place surrounded by other animals. But these services have downsides. Rover's been sued for dogs dying under a watcher's care. Some people complain of money and personal items disappearing. To protect yourself, the Better Business Bureau suggests you meet personally with any Rover sitter before hiring them. Read their reviews carefully and look for sitters who have passed Rover's enhanced background check, not just the basic one. But if you don't like the idea of a kennel, this is a way for them to have some comfort of their home versus going to a kennel where there's lots of barking and they don't understand what's going on. A sitter like Angela can take the stress out of your vacation for both you and your pet. Where over says thousands of people have hired its sitters millions of times and in most cases are completely happy. Whatever you do, don't waste your money. I'm John Batteries for RTV6. And working for you with an important and kind of disturbing health alert. So new research shows that what I'm doing right now during the newscast, ignoring Amanda, which I shouldn't be doing because she's great to work with, looking down at your phone could give you so-called head horns. What's that? An Australia survey of 1,200 x-rays found that 33% had horn-like growths on the lower part of the skull just above the neck. I mean, who wants that? The study only looked at people wow. 18 to 30 years old. Medical experts say they think repeated forward tilting of the head during phone or tablet use lengthens and strains tendons, mm. stimulating these bone spur-like growths. It's not just about the spur. It is about the underlying structures. And this is a, the spur is a warning sign. It is a flashing light that is reminding us that there is poor underlying posture in this region. So skeptics point out that there's no proof of phone use causing these girls. I'm gonna stick with the skeptics on this one. <laughs> but some researchers say this might be a sign humans are physically evolving 
because of technology. We'll see what happens. In other local news, Colts owner Jim Ursay continues to add to his rock and roll collection. And as you can imagine, it is not cheap. Ursay went on a spending spree at the David Gilmore Guitar Collection auction at Christie's in New York. Gilmore is a legendary guitarist for Pink Floyd. Ursay spent around $4 million for the guitar known as the Black Strat. It's a 1969 Fender Stratocaster that Gilmore played for several Pink Floyd albums. Ursay then bought a six-string acoustic guitar from Gilmore. He paid $900,000 for that. And by the way, that does all go to charity. Okay, in total, the Colts owner spent about $5 million at the auction. He says he's proud to be the steward for the important piece of rock music history. If I had one of those guitars right now, zing, <laughs> I would play like Wayne, Rain, go, <laughs> go away. away. <laughs> <laughs> Can I? All right. You know, everybody here, is right now. Yeah, you know, here we go again. We started off great with the yeah. sunshine. Beautiful. Think finally, a nice day. And here we have storms moving into the area, and some of them are on the severe side uh, this evening. Now, as we go throughout the course of the evening hours here, we're going to continue to have a severe threat to the south. To the north, I think you probably get into some rain, but you probably avoid the severe weather. Here's the heavy rain from Rockville to Vetersburg. Some light rain from Crawfordsville now moving into Hendricks County. What you do not see here is a whole lot in the way of lightning. So that is good news. You slide to the south, and here's where the storms are a little more potent across the area. And you see a little more in the way of lightning here from Bloomfield to Spencer. It's getting ready to push into the Bloomington area. So in southern locations, by far the biggest concern is going to be the potential for flash flooding. And there's a flash flood watch for all the counties you see here in green that extends towards Terre Haute, even those are that, uh, those counties are in yellow because that's where the severe thunderstorm watch is posted. And we do have a warning into the Bloomfield area for a severe thunderstorm. So to the south are where all our issues are going to be throughout the course of the evening. And you can see that finally, we've been waiting for this to happen and we expected it to happen. Finally, these storms are starting to dive down to the south. So we probably just get a glancing blow with the rain here in Indianapolis. While southern locations, you have some stronger winds and also some very, very heavy rainfall. So as we go over to TrueCast, you can see most of this action moves through during the evening hours, kind of wrapping up as we work our way into the late evening hours. Then overnight tonight, there could be the potential for some showers and downpours, uh, but probably nothing severe during the overnight hours. You notice the Storm Prediction Center has Terre Haute to Bloomington and Seymour under the slight risk. It's an enhanced risk across extreme southwestern Indiana, but that does not include uh, many of our counties. And so as we go throughout the evening, again, it's this area here, Bloomfield to Spencer. Uh, over towards the Bedford area that probably has the best chance of picking up some additional thunderstorm warnings. The main threat, flooding, damaging winds, secondary, not too concerned this evening about potential for hail and or tornadoes across the area. Here's the view right now in downtown. As you look off uh, to the west and to the south, temperatures are in the 70s right now. Those will cool once the rain moves in. So if you do have plans this evening, and I know there's a sold out show up at a Ruoff with Thomas Rhett, I do think you deal with some rain at the start of that show or while you're tailgating. However, as the show goes on, there'll be some spotty showers giving way just cloudy skies. Although in Noblesville, you do miss out on the severe threat. That's the good news. So I think that show could go on. You may get a little wet uh, with some of that rain, but not expecting much in the way of lightning there. Saturday and Sunday, temperatures into the mid 80s. The humidity comes up as well. Saturday, just some spotty storms in the forecast. As we get into Sunday, they become a little more numerous, but there's lots of dry hours, both Saturday and Sunday. But we look forward to Tuesday. That's what's going to start a nice dry stretch of weather for us that's going to take us through much of the middle half of next week. So I was in beautiful Brown County over the past two days. Yeah. I was surprised to see the corn growing, but I know farmers are just frustrated because yeah. this water is just not helping them do their job. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's just been the amount of days so far this month. Here we are on the 21st. I think yeah. 11 out of the 21 days uh, we've seen rain. And the first four days of June, we saw no rain. So you can even kind of narrow that window down a little bit more. So yeah, it's been very, very wet. Hopefully we'll start to flip the script here soon. Todd, thank you. We'll see you on the Now India next few minutes. We'll be right back. Ed Martin Nissan. The only name you need to know. Welcome back. You're watching the news at 5 on RTV6. We're following a high-profile capital murder case that has the nation's attention. With our Scripps team at CORE TV, Julie Grant has the latest tonight. Julie? 
A very good day to you. I'm Julie Grant here at Court TV, and today we are covering a capital murder case out of Orlando, Florida. Scott Edward Nelson is accused of first degree murder for allegedly killing his neighbor's nanny. Jennifer Lynn Fulford was found brutally killed. Her body was abandoned in the woods, and police say she died of stab wounds and asphyxia. Blood, as well as other evidence, with both the defendant and Fulford's DNA, were found in her abandoned car. Now, prosecutors are seeking the death penalty. Jury selection is wrapping up as they are trying to seat a death qualified jury. That is something that is very difficult. It means that each person chosen believes they will be able to follow the law regardless of their personal opinions and recommend a sentence of death if it's warranted. We do have reporters for you on the ground. We will be bringing you gavel to gavel coverage the moment this trial begins. Also, we are still covering the real life Southern murder mystery case out of South Carolina. Did Michael Colucci murder his own wife, Sarah Lynn, or did she kill herself? A verdict is imminent and you won't want to miss it. Stay with Court TV for all your latest in legal news. I'm Julie Grant. Now back to you in the studio. Julie, thank you for that update. You can stream Court TV anywhere 24 seven at courttv.com. After almost five decades, a 94 year old woman has been reunited with something she thought she would never see again. That's why I love this story because Florine Bush says she lost her wedding band sometime in the 1970s while she was wow. gardening outside of her home in Tennessee. So throughout the years, she mentioned her gold band and how she missed it. She mentioned it again at her nursing home last week. And this time a man named Wesley White heard her. As a white loves to test his metal detectors, you can see he set his sights on finding that wedding ring that was lost nearly a half century ago. Now get this, White said after about a 90 minute search, he and his friend struck gold. All right. They come knocking on the door. So we found it, we found it, you know. There wasn't a scratch on the ring. I was really thrilled. I didn't think I'd ever see it anymore. That's awesome. I That's hope you can find my wallet. But go ahead, Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> well, Florine Bush's son says he expects the ring to be passed down and become a family heirloom. I need him to find my wallet and my car keys next time. I'm going to call him next time. <laughs> Good luck to her. <laughs> but first, on the Now Indy coming up, this weekend, can give, you can give some cats and dogs in need a forever home. Working for you, what you need to know before you go and adopt. You're watching RTV6 News on this Friday.